Hold on. Boom. Okay, we are live, sir. We are live Woo! here today with Salvatore Pius, one of my favorite people on the planet right now. He is doing my first ever interview. This is going to be Hard Truths with Salvatore Pius and Ashton Forbes. So right off the bat, sir, go ahead and introduce yourself. Never ever call me sir, number one. Call me brother. Got it, brother. That, that really goes to the soul with me. So, Ashton, thank you very much. This is an honor to be your first interview. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure there will be a lot more after this one. Trust me on that. Oh, I love it. Now, and I hope to be uh, in further interviews as well. That'd be great. Yeah. Now, all right. Let me give a disclaimer um, right off the bat. Uh, I'm required to do this. So I come on this podcast as a private citizen. And the, uh, let's say, the statements, speculations, opinions that I make are in no way implicating the United States Navy nor the United States Space Force. Got it. They are my own. And as such, I shall present them. Um, now, can I give uh, five minutes sure. sort of origins? And okay, the floor is yours, sir. Uh, Sal, the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Um, I was born in Romania. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud of my Romanian heritage. You can call me American apple pie made in Romania. <laughs> I just love hearing that. I heard it once before, and I wow, yeah. I like that. So. Uh, um, I will say something in Romanian so people are convinced that I'm from that. Sunt mândru că sunt român, trăiască poporul român, trăiască România, nimic fără Dumnezeu. Basically, it says I am very proud to be Romanian. Uh, hooray for the Romanian people, hooray for Romania, and nothing without God. Um, and as far as why I'm here, uh, yeah. Recently, a friend of mine told me that they have changed uh, right after the Tim Ventura interview, where I gave an interesting rendition of the mm -hmm. Pais effect called Pais effect resurgence. By the way, I practically implore your audience and everyone on the live stream to Google uh, the Pais effect yep. resurgence. Those three words, Pais effect resurgence, it, it goes directly to a Tim Ventura page. We will tell one day whether it's taken down or not. Yeah, it's uh, you know another little point in the spectrum. Let's call it that. Yeah. So basically, in in Wikipedia on October uh, 18th, I believe of mm -hmm. this year, they changed right after the interview. Almost they changed to say that my work now represents a scam, a pseudoscience, disinformation. When you go into Bing now, the AI agent never before has it done this. It calls my work crack pottery. And it's almost as if my work is starting to have a concerted effort to be undermined, mm -hmm. shadow banned. And uh, you have to question why, especially after the Tim Ventura interview. You have to see that to, uh, to see where I'm coming from. Now, it is very important to also understand that I challenge the mainstream physics community to send their best. We're talking about people like Carver Mead. Mm -hmm. We're talking about people like Seth Lloyd, Max, yeah. uh, Max Tegmark, um, David Gross, uh, Brian Keating, uh, Stefan Alexander. Yeah. Others, Frank Wilczek, um, any Nobel Prize winner they have out there, I, I wish to have a committee whereupon I'm given one hour, I'll go to the blackboard and prove yeah. to them that the Pais effect and the superforce concepts are correct. Yep. I'll show them exactly how they were derived. They're ex extremely simple and minimalistic math. Mm -hmm. I believe in Occam's razor. I do not believe that mathematical acrobatics should pass for great physics. As a matter of fact, I believe the simpler the mathematics, the more important the physics, especially if you have a good understanding of what the problem is. Yeah. Many times, great physics is found by accident, is not actually looked for. And uh, one other thing that I wish to mention also is that this is not new physics. This is a new perspective on old physics. Wow. And this is what makes it incredibly interesting because there's so many things out there that have not been tried yet. It, mm -hmm. it is as if 
classical electromagnetism theory has been uh, put aside the moment quantum theory came in. A lot of things that were introduced by Oliver Heaviside mm -hmm. into the equation of James Clerk Maxwell were sidelined. And things that should have been looked at weren't. Uh, anyway, I, I, I will not... Uh, there's one more thing that I need to say because um, it, uh, it, it, um, we have to be careful exactly how I answer certain questions on the Pais effect. Sure. Because unfortunately, as almost every other piece of physics out there, the, the Pais effect can be weaponized. Absolutely. And it can create a super weapon of all weapons, a weapons of such incredible power as to render the Tele Ulam device a pop gun in comparison. And this is not hubris. This is no, mathematics no. and physics. Now, it, it, it is also important to realize that a weapon of this nature, any army, and I mean any army that would feel the weapon of this nature first, would become invincible, number one. Number two, and this is incredibly hard, it's very, very important to understand, what the this super weapon would represent is a new epoch in deterrence. No sane nation yeah. is suicidal. And any insane nation should not exist. Yeah. Hence, let's leave the super weapon in the realm of physics, but let let the audience know, let your live stream know that certain things, numbers, frequency ranges, spectrums, I cannot discuss. That's fine. This is something that can be quite detrimental to national security if taken in the, how should I say, from the incorrect perspective. So I will not even touch on that. If I, I, I hope I have your understanding that if I disagree with a question, yeah. I will try to be as, uh, as polite as possible, but I will say, in the interest of national security, I cannot answer that question. Yeah, sir, you already went through like four of my questions right there uh, from your interview, <laughs> from your intro right there. Um, and I just want to agree with you on that front. You know, I've heard you say multiple times that you are not a spy and you are not a patriot. I am also not a spy and I am a patriot as well. Um, and to that sense, the, the thing I would bring up is this is actually one of the optional things I was going to bring up at the end, but you just kind of addressed it is that uh, my opinion is that most likely our foreign adversaries have already potentially figured out this type of technology if what you're going to be telling to us is true. And what that means from a humanities perspective is we need to be very responsible with this technology because I agree with Extreme. you. I, I talked about it last night in my space that... Mutual assured destruction. Agreed. But it's a whole different epoch of deterrence that we are... It's not just nuclear opening. weapons anymore. Now we're talking about something that's no, millions of times more dangerous. We are something that can modify space-time. Exactly. And as a matter of fact, the Schwinger limit, breaking, breaking the Schwinger limit points to that fact. This is hmm. physics. Absolutely. This is not, this is not crack pottery. It's this not is fiction. physics. It's just no, science. No, absolutely not. Sometimes I wish it was. Yeah, me too, Unfortunately, sir. Unfortunately, <laughs> it is not science fiction. This is science fact. And I'm like you, if yeah. I accidentally call you sir, it's just a matter of respect. I do that a lot for people that I respect, and you're one of the people so that do I, I respect. So do I. So I have the same thing. Don't take personal and offense if I do it. And bothered by it. Yeah. My own boss is like, stop calling me sir. <laughs> He's a great dude. So yeah. anyway. So you ready to I dig into this thing? Because I think that you touched on part of what I want to begin with, which is... Yes, sir. Um, You've mentioned in your previous podcast, and I don't want to rehash all the stuff that you've talked about before, especially Absolutely. with Kurt, who I thought you had a great interview with. I listened to the whole thing, and he's a very smart guy, especially when he was talking about quantum gravity. I just thought, wow, that, this guy is super intelligent. Oh, Kurt Jaimongo <laughs> is truly yeah. a theoretical thing. If he was representative of the mainstream physics community and he had a say, I'm 100% that at least you would give me a hearing. Yep. At yeah. least. And I think that hearing. our plan here, what I want to do is hopefully vindicate you in their eyes as well and get that hearing that you want. Because I think that what we're going to be talking about today, the physics that we're going to be going over is practical. It's stuff that can really exist and we need to make sure that it gets the proper respect. And that kind of goes into my first question and point is that you've mentioned that your papers were submitted to, I believe, Cornell and they wouldn't publish them without a sponsor, right? Why do you yes, think that is? What, what, what do you think your view is there? 
uh, uh, Cornell University Archive is, in my opinion, the best preprint uh, service of all time. As a matter of fact, once you publish an archive, most likely your paper will be published in a highly impacted journal. If at least if not a high impact, at least a moderate impact journal. So in other words, 100% your paper will be published. So I have great respect for archive. Uh, the fact that they need sponsors, maybe it's quite possible that a lot of uh, individuals put certain physics in there that is, I, I look, Joe the plumber can write a physics paper if he understands mm -hmm. the, the, the precept, the, the foundational, the fundamentals of physics. Once you understand them, you can write a physics paper and even Joe the plumber can publish an archive if he has a sponsor, unfortunately. Yeah. But the whole idea being is uh, we're not living in the time of Einstein, where basically a Swiss patent clerk can get five papers published. This is the Anno Mirabilis, the, yeah. the year of the greatest five papers, in my opinion, that opened physics to a whole different dimension of, 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 uh, of, um, of reality, of, of possibility, mm -hmm. conditional possibility. There's no such thing as impossibility. There are only conditional possibilities. But to go back to the idea of, of why I think archive is blocking and, yeah. and needs a sponsor is sometimes you can just you cannot just go on archive and say, look, Einstein was wrong. And here is the please, you know, there there have been so many proofs as to the fact that the gravitational field equations of Einstein must be at least partially correct because yeah. there's so much experimental evidence for it. Yeah. So bring, if you have a theoretical argument against Einstein, then you must argue from a very strong mathematical and physical background and also present experimental proof. And some of these papers, unfortunately, do not. Now, I understand where they're coming from. However, in my opinion, we do not live in the time of Planck, and Einstein and uh, Heisenberg yep. and the great ones, even Feynman. I mean, Feynman is what about 1950s? Yeah. Uh, it, it, still, it's a we don't time live now. in those. So I think it's that, extremely yeah. hard to publish. And sometimes people that should not even get there because they know the editor or the chief editor, please, nepotism in physics? Unpermissible. That's what and, and, uh, I would argue anyway, as well, just to kind of not to cut you off, but I think that I agree with you there. And I, what I would argue is that so academia has kind of forgotten what science is, right? Science is a scientific method. It's the uh, study of observable reality of being able to experiment uh, and be able to prove concepts, you know, and I think that now what you just pointed out is that it's been inundated with credentialism, right? And saying, who do you know and what do you know? Um, and so... You know, one kind of point that I would say, kind of closing that bit off, because I think that you have been done a disservice, is that sometimes seeing is believing. You know, imagine if we had video proof or experimental proof out there that could prove your concepts, right? Maybe that would give another level of credibility to the things that you're saying. Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. Experiment trumps theory every time. Totally. Again, experiment trumps theory every time Absolutely. and it's an interesting verb and a lot of people get a little itchy when they hear that word but still experiment trumps theory every time now can i just give a Go quick ahead. rendition of the pais effect resurgence oh because yeah. it's important for people to uh, before uh, in 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 my papers actually in my patents there was one paper that i was able to publish yeah. in a, a high impact journal IEEE, Transactions on Plasma Science. Yeah. Uh, it's on the plasma compression fusion device. And the uh, chief editor had uh, two two different, uh, I went through two different review boards. I, I mean, it took a long time, as you can see. If you look, at the, it took a long time for me to publish this paper. I went back and forth, argue this, argue. but at least they were open-minded enough to realize it was something new. Yep. something worthy of being seen again this is all i ask for is a chance to express myself to express this physics that i think can have some meaning to the progress of civilization 
Yep. I want nothing more. I don't want royalties. I don't want money for that. I don't want anything except the progress of civilization. We need unification of civilization in order that we do not perish from the earth. I'm sir. afraid of the future, sir. Yeah, it looked yeah. extremely bleak at this point in time. And, and we have, we either come together hmm? and as one, one unification, one unified civilization, or we shall perish. That's apart. what I've said many times as well, actually. And I think that what you said about science is um, very accurate too. And that the way I've seen science too, is that it can be encrusted, very molded, and that it takes somebody to push it forward, break through the barrier, right? And with your science, that's what I see is that I see that people don't want to believe in it because they haven't been told that it's possible. And if they were to just look at your, your math, look at your models, I think that they would realize that there's something there that's actually substantial and then it can push us forward. The thing you said about unification, I say that almost every single time is that we live in such a divided world right now where yeah. if we get that unification, this, this science could potentially be that thing that unifies us towards common purpose, right? The physics of the super force, in my opinion, can bring about unification of, of mind and soul. Yeah. The yeah. two should not be driven apart. They're one and the same. One manifestation of the other. All is one. One is all. So, this is the true basis of yeah. hermeticism. Yeah. And this is the true basis of all future of civilization. If we have a chance to survive, yeah. this is it unification of civilization it has to be a common goal a common objective and why not uh, i remember at one point eric weinstein as a matter of fact mentioned one time travel uh, maybe this should be our final objective to leave this earth yeah. break the shackles of earth break the bounds of earth and and become an interstellar civilization yep. that maybe just maybe will give us a chance for survival. The, the road that we are currently on is total abysmal in perdition. Couldn't agree more. So let's okay. take a, let's attack Let your trip. Okay. Quickly. Oh, actually, Enjoy. I was going to go to that in just a second. I think that's the next okay. question, if you don't mind, because what I want to sure. do is I want to debunk this. There's a, a debunk of a debunk of you. So the biggest thing okay. I think your detractors mention when we talk about your patents is they yes, claim sir. that you can patent anything. Now, what I read from, or from watching your last interview is that only three of your five patents were even approved, which to me would indicate that it's not true. So I would like to get your opinion no. on that, sir. There's very simple way to debunk the, I don't even know what the correct <laughs> terminology is anymore. For example, I don't use UAP, UFOs. You shouldn't erase 70 years of history yeah. just because you, you think that new terminology would somehow eliminate the derision. Mm -hmm. The derision is far more basic than that. History is important, sir. Yep. Never yeah. forget. Never forget history. Okay. But anyway, let, uh, the, the way to argue that is look at the office actions of a great primary examiner called Philip Bonzel of USPTO. Oh my goodness, him and I went back and forth <laughs> between him, Mark Glute, who is the uh, United States Nav Air patent uh, lawyer and also a good friend of mine, an amazing patent lawyer. This, trust me, anybody that can write mm -hmm. those and also the office actions, you should see what Mark did. You should see what Mark Glute did with the office actions in response to Philip Bonzel. Philip Bonzel, I mean, he really bit into the physics. Yep. He said, you cannot tell me that it's possible to create electric fields on the order of 10 to the 18 volts per meter yep. and a induction, magnetic induction, otherwise known as B fields, magnetic flux density on the order of 10 to the nine Teslas. Mm -hmm. And it's an easy way to remember that it's E equals CB, C being the speed of light in free space. But anyway, so that's how I remember the numbers. Sometimes I forget them myself. But the whole idea is once, once you're able to create, it's not exactly that you create E and B of that. It's the energy density that you can create mm -hmm. from rendering the Pais effect. And the Pais effect, speaking to the Pais effect, yeah. is it okay right. if I give Yeah, I think that's a good segue. That was my next thing. So jump on in. What's your definition of the Pais effect for our viewers? Okay, it, it, it can be thought of as controlled 
motion of electrically charged matter going from solid to plasma, undergoing rapid acceleration transients via accelerated vibration and or accelerated spin, yep. leading into very high energy densities being formed. Because remember, the electromagnetic energy flux is really the speed of light C times the energy density, the, the epsilon sub naught, the epsilon, sorry, sometimes I, I yeah. drift into my, my, my English. Yeah. So the, the epsilon uh, zero uh, times um, 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 the electric field square. Yeah. So C times epsilon zero times the electric field square, that is your S, your the magnitude of your pointing vector, let's call it. Okay. That's the electromagnetic flux. Okay. And, and that electromagnetic energy flux, if it's on the order of 10 to the 33 watts per meter square, which really corresponds to a energy density on the order of 10 to the 25 joules per meter cubed, then we can break the Schwinger limit. If we can achieve anything past that, those particular values, we can actually um, put it this way, vacuum decay, complete vacuum decay. Interesting. So The Schwinger limit is really the achievement that all of a sudden, you, the, the very quantum fabric of space-time is unraveled. It mm -hmm. breaks apart. It tears apart. And you can see it by the formation of particle antiparticle pairs mm -hmm. this yeah, is the way about this quite a bit now real quick and, on that and, the vibrations okay, now, no, go, keep going. let me give yes yeah, yeah. let me give i'm sorry um, you're fine Ashen, i promise this is the only time i'll interrupt because it's important to nah, see the the that's why i call it the resurgence of the pice effect yeah. another way to see what the pice effect is all about is to say it's really the generation of extremely high energy densities yep. that are up, up, obtained by the accelerated vibration and or accelerated spin yep. of a non-equilibrium plasma. Okay. That means the plasma that's out of equilibrium. You can think of, of that. Um, they have a term for it called cold plasma, cold hmm. as in, you know, yeah. non-thermal plasma. And it really has to do with the, um, uh, the electrons of this plasma uh, that talks to the plasma density is very high. Uh, uh, I cannot go into numbers, but anyway. Um, okay. So what, right. So these, but uh, the, the, the number of these electrons do not uh, observe something called a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. Okay. That's what a core plasma is all about. Uh, an out of equilibrium or non-equilibrium plasma. Once you drive that far from equilibrium at a particular vibrational frequency, okay. you, can ex you can induce extremely high energy densities. Yeah. If, if you do this locally, think of it, you know, the thing popped into my mind sometimes, you know, and this is some crazy stuff, but anyway, um, think of it as a steak. Okay. You take the meat tenderizer, you know, the big hammer, yep. and you keep on pummeling at the same spot over and over. What do you see eventually? A hole. Yeah. A hole. Ain't that interesting? So is that a the vibrational hole. acceleration there that you're okay. kind of describing? What I'm describing is the unraveling, the ripping apart, the tearing apart locally of the space-time fabric at a quantum level determined by this incredible amount of energy density that is put at that particular point. The more energy you put in a particular point, the more that in, in that locality, space time will break apart, will tear apart. And it's possible that a hole, a hole will develop like a black hole almost. If we truly understand what a black hole is. Um, but you see, I just like Frank Wilczek, see, Frank Wilczek also believes in the materiality of the vacuum. In other words, we, we're dealing, I'm not quite sure if it's a crystal lattice. We're not talking about time crystals here, even though that's another thing that Professor Wilczek is greatly known for. But we're talking about almost like a, um, the, on a, at a quantum level, you can think of space-time as being a material. It could be a superfluid, mm -hmm. but it also has almost a, a space-time geometric structure to it. Yep. 
And that's what my super power speaks to. And what is your thought? It may not be mine. Yeah. It's quite possible others have come up with these ideas yeah. before. But the equation one in that super force paper, and please post the super force paper and also yep. the AIAA paper and also the IEEE TPS paper to your live stream and send it to everyone mm -hmm. you know. Those three papers best represent my work. I, I believe in the, in the number three, uh, uh, like uh, a, a great man that, that once lived. Uh, and uh, I shall not mention because I mentioned him before and many, and he, trust me, this Nikola Tesla will go down in history as one of the greatest we've ever had. I and, agree with and, you, sir. and the way he was treated, abysmal, absolutely abysmal. That dude, J.P. Morgan, yeah. watch out. Watch out if you know what I mean. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think that, um, interesting enough, so I think for people who are in the chat, you know, what you just said about the papers, I posted them on my Twitter before. I'll throw them in the, the uh, description later on as well. But share those papers. Oh. Sal here is telling you guys that, you know, share them far and wide. Um, those yes. are very important. Now... With respect to uh, some of the way you were just talking about around the pious effect, you know, I think yes. that what I saw in one of your past interviews too was that using vibrations as opposed to spin is potentially more beneficial. Could you explain that a little bit? Yes, sir. You can, um, for example, the we we tried an experiment uh, called the high energy electromagnetic field generator to see whether we can get the um, magnitudes of the pointing vector, namely the electromagnetic energy fluxes, uh, very high up yeah. based on accelerated spin of an electrically charged object. Uh, unfortunately, we could not get an electric charge more than 10 to the minus eight coulombs. You put that in that sigma squared term, which is the surface charge density squared, and you'll see it's, it's quite a deterrent. We're talking about 10 to the minus 16 going against you. Hmm. And uh, even though we try to make the test section very small, to, it's still. However, for anyone that's out there and wants to see further what the high energy electromagnetic field generator experiment brought, I encourage them to put a flyer in and actually get the unclassified report. There were two anomalies. There were two anomalies that were uh, observed. As a matter of fact, some very highly placed people from the technical committee of the Senate Armed Services Committee came to Navier Pax to interrogate, how should I say, the members of the Invention Evaluation Board on why they passed these five patent applications. Hmm. Because a lot of people said that if anything, these should have been classified. So there was a whole team that was sent from the Senate Armed Service Committee to investigate. I, I'm pretty sure that uh, that certain individuals, I, I shall not name names, but they must have said, oh, this was a scam. This was a total uh, uh, misappropriation of funds, even though we're talking about only, what, 0.5 million for like, I don't know, like 50 people over a period of three years. Hmm. Please, I mean, do the math and you'll yeah. see what I'm talking about compared to some of the stuff that's going on. And anyway, I shall, uh, I shall not make it too dark no. now. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so the whole idea being is there's a report out there. It's yeah. unclassified and it talks about two. And so even with a charge like 10 to the minus eight coulombs, mm -hmm. instead of the one coulomb needed mm -hmm. to get the kind of energy densities we were truly looking for. To observe certain phenomena that I cannot discuss. Those uh, are That's fine. anyway, yeah. Um, so, even with that, two anomalies were reported, and actually in the report. Wow. So that's interesting. Yeah, uh, along... I'm, I'm talking about experimental observations. We're not talking about theory yeah, here. Yeah. We're talking about experimental observations. And that's my next yeah. question too, related to this accelerated vibration. Like, what's the delivery mechanism? Can a laser do that, or can you speak to that, or is that? Uh, sure, sure. I, yeah. I just speak with it, but only in the general. Yeah, sure. Just to point, just to point that uh, it is very interesting that the 2023 physics Nobel Prize mm -hmm. went for what? Electron dynamics mm -hmm. induced by 
attosecond lasers yeah interesting into the minus 18 hmm. second lasers very interesting when i talk about femtosecond we're talking about attosecond there's a reason hmm. so let me say let me just leave it there interesting yeah and okay are you familiar with meta materials sir probably right i have some familiarity <laughs> with that yes sir so but uh, yeah. i i uh, i would rather not discuss that portion okay it has sure. something to do with certain things so yeah that's yeah. fine so let's sure. go on to the next one then in terms of your yeah. patents uh, and this might be a question i don't know if you can answer or not but do you think that these patents are operable today yes Based sir what we know about technology See, a lot of people have questioned on that and said, how dare the USPTO publishers, they were not properly enabled because, you know, they all the ingredients are there, yeah. but you have, you have to know what you're doing, number one. Number two, it is important to understand the nature of the materials, the piezoelectrics, exactly how they operate. For example, what is the main difference between strontium titanate, barium titanate? What exactly is something called the most power effect? Mm -hmm. Anyway, I mentioned it actually in a publication of mine, one of the few papers I was able to actually publish in a journal, but only because it was in the beginning of the journal. And I think my, my opinion is, is that the chief editor needed papers <laughs> more than anything. And, and, he was taken aback by by the the what's what's the best the ambition of the idea yeah. let's let's put it was actually the high energy electromagnetic field generator that paper that i published yeah. i think it was the international journal a journal of space science and engineering yeah. and trust me i tried to publish the super force paper at the same journal thinking you know I published the conditional possibility of spacecraft of space uh, um, yeah. conditional possibility of spacecraft propulsion at superluminal speeds mm -hmm. and that high energy electromagnetic field generator in the same volume I think it was volume 3 of I think I think it was issue anyway it was um they were both published in the same volume one of them as a technical note the other as a full fledged paper um a technical paper uh i try to publish the super force paper in the same journal they they would not it's wow. it's as if my name is is on some sort of a blacklist you know they me oh salvatore no 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 just i'm talking about sending papers and having rejections within a matter of 12 to 15 hours hmm. I, wow that's interesting. What I'm saying? I don't know. Have you ever gotten the, uh, my results are changing quickly. If I Google you right now, is that going to happen? <laughs> it's a bit of a badge of honor, you know? I, I, uh, between you and I, uh, I have some friends back in New York city mm -hmm. that, uh, how should I say they watch for my statistics. One of them said, dude, one time I Google your name because he, he watched it. He, he actually yeah. has a statistical charge of, it. he said that at one point in time, my when you Google Salvatore Pais, you got over 300 million results. And all of a sudden, it dropped to like <laughs> 7 million. And then it went up. He had no idea what was going on. He said, this is not possible. Well, what, what are we talking about here? I mean, you have numbers higher than Andrew Tate. Yeah. <laughs> but, oh, I... I hope I didn't get anybody canceled for from even no, mentioning this. I don't think so. I don't, at least it's not in the fun, sense that you are. But connected to Romania. Yeah. But anyway. <laughs> so uh, right. I think sure. I wanted to jump into the superforce in your equation okay, number one, sure. which you <laughs> wanted to talk about because I read through your paper. I looked through all the patents as well. Tried to do my best as a layman to understand them. And when I look at your superforce, uh, you know, especially with equation number one, it basically says that if you look carefully at the mathematical structure of the Planck force. You can realize that this is the super force. It does not contain the H bar. I've heard you say this, namely the modified reduced Planck constant. Therefore, it can relate to quantum phenomena exhibiting macroscopic classical behavior, namely a macroscopic quantum phenomenon. Now, when I look at that, I think, are we talking about a unification of quanta and macro? And is that what you, how you would argue your uh, equations here? Absolutely, sir. Equation one speaks to exactly what you're talking about. And as a matter of fact, page two of the page, it's just a three page paper. Yeah. I mean, anybody, for goodness sake, 
oh, maybe that's why I got a 15 hour rejection because it was extremely fast. But you know, just that equation one yeah. is so powerful because I will tell you what it says. It actually says it's the super force that is the energy gradient at both the Planck scale and the energy gradient at the horizon scale, which is when talk about observable universe. Yeah. How is that possible that the super force can be the energy gradient at the very lowest of scales, signifying the lowest of our realms, the mm -hmm. quantum realm, quantum. and also the highest that we understand the observable universe. Not only yeah. that, I believe because of the way it's fashioned. For example, if one day we were to find out that our universe doesn't have an observable radius, say, of like on the order of 10 to the 27, mm. uh, 10 to the 27 meters, it has something on the order of 10 to the 80 meters or something of that nature. Yeah. That equation would give you how much mass right. is in that structure, which would think what that means. It yeah. means really we're living in some sort of a matrix, like a space time geometric structure that can be altered. Yeah, oh, a construct, opinion, right? A construct. A construct of some sorts which is, uh, I'm not going to talk to the simulation hypothesis yeah. because I think this is very real. I I, I, I believe true. when I pinch myself, it really hurts. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so uh, I, Einstein said something far, far, far more uh, subtle and far more uh, yeah. philosophical in nature. Namely, he believes the moon is still there even though he's not looking. <laughs> I, Absolutely. That's a good argument. Yeah. And I think that we can, the spiritual stuff we can dig into potentially in the follow up interview, because I think that that we probably are on the same wavelength there in terms of our beliefs yes. on that. And what, the only Absolutely. thing I would say is that from my own personal perspective, the more I dig into the science and dig around the science, especially around this, the more spiritual I actually become. I thought it would be the opposite, but it turns out that no, I think that I have more of a spiritual understanding the more I dig into science, which is very interesting. And I want equation one from now on to be addressed that as the super force equation. You know, if Emicho Kaku can, can say that he's, you know, he has the God equation, then, you know, I think my hubris <laughs> level is far lower by saying it's mine. It's the super force equation. Okay. It was your, Thank you. The way you did, explained it, um, I think I've heard you say before as well, is the super force is acting on space time geometric structure at all points in space and time as well. Is Absolutely, that an equivalent sir. definition? Which means what? It also speaks to quantum entanglement. That yeah. means every point in, in space and time is connected because of the existence of the super force. Yes, it exists at 10 to the minus 35 meters, which mm -hmm. is the Planck length, but still it, oh, one, one more thing the super force equation speaks to, which is when I realized that I said, whoa, 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 oh my goodness. Uh, if you put in that equation, uh, okay, so the super force, the equation for it is C to the power of four divided by big G. Yep. So it basically says speed of light to the fourth power divided by big G. Mm -hmm. And and um, if you put in, um, if you realize there's such a thing, for example, okay, if it talks to an energy gradient at every scale, because that's what equation one really says, if it goes from the very smallest to the very highest, maybe it goes for everything in between. So I tried the mass of the proton. Yeah. Guess what the super force says? Okay, I put in the mass, so in yeah. um, the super force being mc squared divided by that characteristic length, yeah. I put in the mass of the proton, which is like 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Okay. And guess what I get? I get a, a characteristic length on the order of what? The Schwarzschild radius for proton. So the proton is treated by the super force as a black hole. No wonder the proton takes so long to decay, yeah. if ever. Got it. That is an amazing equation. The super force equation will one day be known by physics everywhere. I hope. I, you <laughs> I know, so and I do not mind if they rederive it, they call it their own, but at least, you know, somewhere in a footnote, they say, you know, some crackpot called Pais thought of this too. Uh, you know, we're not going to call you that. I, I want to be respectful about sensation. that. I know that you're sensitive as well about <laughs> what people call yeah. you. And I think that that's part of the vindication that I want to go through uh, with you as well is that. I you tell know, you, sir, yeah. I've been, I've been, I mean, well, we talk about blood, tears, sweat, and misery of the mind and the soul mm -hmm. over this. Because yeah. 
the moment they called my work, uh, and I understand, may, maybe I understand, I'm not quite sure exactly what why the drive war zone called my papers, the UFO patents, the UFO Navy patents. Yeah. The moment, again, it, it became a symbol of ridicule and mainstream physicists would not even look at that because, again, symbol of derision. And I understand why they changed the, the terminology to UAP, but you shouldn't. I agree. Because we're talking about the history of so many people that were involved in the subject matter. And for them and them alone, we should leave that term as is. My opinion, the U in UFO should be unacknowledged. <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> I agree anyway, with the UFO yeah. thing as well. And I also don't yeah. want to link your work to UFO because it's really just science. It's not necessarily related to UFOs, although there's obviously a connection there because from what people see, it can describe that as well. So. You know, that's why when we look at the description of my discussion with you, it doesn't mention that at all, because what we're digging into here is the science, right? We're digging into yes, quanta sir. and macro unification. We're going to dig into yes, superconductivity here in a minute as well. Yes. And that's the stuff yes. that I want to learn about, the stuff that's not fiction, that's just science. So one quick question. One more thing ahead. about yeah. the second. Uh, Go for it. Sorry, about, and I promise you not to interrupt again. Oh, you're fine. Bad. Oh, it's your show okay. here, sir. <laughs> no, no, no. You're the Trust star. Me, this is your first interview, so I should be a little more polite. But this is my chance to, yeah. to say certain things. And who knows, maybe I get a word from command, shut the, uh, and, and I can't, and this may be my last interview. Who knows? Who knows? Anything can happen. The truth yeah. is. But as Andrew Tate once said, I will never suicide myself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but anyway, uh, okay. Now, now the, the, uh, the, the idea being uh, on the second uh, page of that paper, on the second page of that paper, of the Superforce paper, uh, take a good look at the way that I prove that this is the force of unification. There's a remarkable formalism, very simple, that the strong nuclear force divided by the electromagnetic force is one divided by the, the, the fine structure constant. Uh, it's usually on the order of one divided by 137. And it's like 0.07. But anyway, and it's very interesting that when you actually take the decimal of that one divided by 137 and, and do it in a calculator and you okay. see what I'm talking about, it's as if the numbers become a wave. It's as if the numbers, oh. it's, it's a vibration or so. It's, it's very strange. Just look at the way the numbers change and how it's, That's trust interesting me, to me, do one divided by 137 and you'll see what I'm talking about. Got now, um, uh, what's... Wh What's truly, uh, okay, what was, uh, yeah, so so using that idea, I was able to show very simply that the strong nuclear force equals the gravitational force at the Planck scale equals the, the super force. So that the strongest of the forces that we know of, the strong nuclear force, which operates on the order of 10 to the minus 15 meters, mm -hmm. uh, so one centimeter, and the gravitational force, which is the highest that we know of, hence uh, the general relativity, the Einstein field equations and so forth. So those two scales are at the Planck scale. Those two forces are equal and equal to the super force. Hence, the super force is a force of, unifi of unification. That makes sense. And, and then you can actually find on that same page, very simple with some rudimentary math, something that I called in another paper conditional replacement technique and one can google it and see what I'm talking about the, the CRT some people called it at one point cathode ray tube I just don't yeah. anyway it, the conditional replacement technique if taken simple in that linear equation um, you can actually show that in both the Dirac and the Schrodinger equation the super force exists because it's an energy gradient hmm. at the Planck scale. So do you it, believe it, then that it's, oh, go, go. it's so yeah. it's so simple. This is why I love it, because I like simple mathematics that points to great physics. Yeah. That idea of coupling the two amazes. I understand that a lot of people are fascinated by ER equal EPR and ADS equal CFT and so forth. And we can discuss this at one point of, in time. But 
I'm sorry, Juan Maldacena. We live in a sitter vacuum, yeah. as Eric Belinda once pointed out. I'm pretty sure Juan will be very mad at me at this point in time. But anyway, Lenny Susskind too. But I have great respect. By the way, Lenny Susskind started out his thing as a plumber in Brooklyn. <laughs> Ain't that some? Speaking of Joe the plumber, yeah, he doesn't became one start, of the right? best theoretical physicists. Oh, I would love to have him on the committee as well. He he's one of these visual mathematicians. He believes in geometry. He has a very interesting mind. The way his mind works, Lenny's, and he's like at, at a certain age, and yet I, I couldn't tell. I mean, the man is 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 is, is a giant. It's a cerebral giant, you know. Yeah. So age, advanced age, doesn't mean a thing. No, Just like pedigree doesn't mean a thing. Why shouldn't the Joe the Plumber be able to even publish in the uh, archive? Totally because agree. most likely if you can publish an archive, maybe your paper will be seen in science, nature, uh, physical review letters. It'd be nice. But anyway, that's a dream. <laughs> All right. So um, I just for the viewers, you know, when we talk about unifying quanta and macro, I think I saw a question that was kind of helps uh, for them to understand. Do you believe that faster than light communication is possible based on your equations that we talked about the superforce? Um, we have to be careful to, to understand the nature of the medium okay. within the same medium. So in other words, I, I believe a, a medium speaks to a, a given uh, uh, light speed, most likely having to do the index of the of refraction of that particular medium yeah. and also coupled with the speed of light in free space. There's a very simple formula that you can see. Uh, yeah. It's a ratio. But anyway. So in other words, if we're able to modify the medium, it is quite possible that so-called faster than the speed of light is, is feasible. But within that given medium, no, Einstein was correct. It, it is a quote-unquote physical barrier, but only, only presented by the nature of the medium. That medium can be tenderized. <laughs> you can tenderize it to the point a hole is formed if you yeah. put enough energy density at that particular point in space and time huh. cool so that i appreciate that answer i think that helps out with the viewers quite a bit and i think the next thing we want to jump into is superconductivity so can you yeah. define superconductivity for the audience and then in addition to that you talk about high energy densities can room temperature superconductors achieve those densities and how so okay uh that second one i would rather not discuss okay. for reasons that i've said before got it the first one, it's in the theoretical realm. Oh, speaking of which, I would love, I believe Leon Cooper is still alive, and Stefan Alexander knows him. I would love him on that committee, too. Yeah, okay. And we'll, we're talking about the BCS theory of superconductivity. Yeah. We're talking about one of the, I, I should not use the term gods to describe men, especially uh, since hubris may be greatly involved. So, but he is one of the giants of superconductivity. And I believe he's still alive. And also Brian Josephson. Yeah. Squid, superconducting quantum interference devices. Oh, my goodness. The stuff that we can do with that. But anyway. Uh, uh, I hope some of these people are yeah. watching so that they, you know, you're name dropping a lot Brian, of people who are really smart. So <laughs> Yeah. Both Brian Josephson and Leon Cooper are more than welcome on that committee. I would, yeah. I would love to hear. Uh, oh, my goodness. They're such giants. But carbon meat, carbon meat has to be there. I mean, this is a man. This is the father of true semi, in my opinion, of of semiconductor technology. But not only that, he has such ideas. For example, even in gravitation. Mm -hmm. But because he has the pedigree as an electrical engineer, even as a professor at Caltech, that man is not being heard properly by the community that supposedly he's not part of. Science should not have limits. Agreed, sir. So what's your definition of superconductivity for the audience? Superconductivity, well, I would put an electrically charged superfluid could be a superconductor. Mm -hmm. So the idea uh, being that it's possible that we can actually slow photons in a superconductor. Interesting. See? I've heard that's that. That's interesting, isn't it? Very yeah. Interesting. It, it talks to the ability of medium. Now, a superconductor itself is, is really basically zero resistance as the electron flow goes through a certain medium, mm -hmm. say a wire, let's call it a wire, uh, for lack of a better term, even though the way electricity actually moves, 
along the wire rather than through it is very questionable. But anyway, I, I should not go there because I'm already called a crackpot. I don't need so. Even though there was a very interesting uh, podcast on on veritasium as as to that illusion that uh, hey, the, the, okay, I'm I'm diverging. I'm taking oh, so yeah. many times. No so so the whole okay. And there's one more thing that defines a superconductor. That's the Meissner's effect. That's the ability of of the of of the superconductor to actually, I believe it actually forms a magnetic field of itself, of, of huh. its own, some sort of eddy currents that actually form on the superconductor and something called the London penetration depth. Hmm. See, a magnetic field will actually penetrate the superconductor. Interesting. Unlike because I thought the, it worked uh, around it. See, that's the beauty of it. It actually goes to the London penetration depth, but what it does, it forms eddy currents which talk to a magnetic field opposite that repels yeah. the magnetic field that's put upon the superconductor. So yeah, but yeah. there is a London penetration depth, and so and, and you can. I actually I remember that I, I I wrote a paper. I think the room temperature super the um, the AIWA SciTech uh, speaks. Mm -hmm. It was a presentation that was based on a paper that I wrote that I presented at I, a, AIWA SciTech 2019. And please make sure you post that. Because slides four to slide nine is extremely important. I even uh, in one slide actually solved the vacuum catastrophe. You know the whole idea. You know, I'm looking at it right now. That yeah. we get 120 yeah. orders of magnitude difference between the quantum realm and and how 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 is that possible? Well, it speaks to the idea that maybe we're not dealing with flying lamps here. We're dealing with some uh, space cells that mm -hmm. of a different dimension and terahertz frequencies. Ain't that some? But anyway, yeah, that's as far as I go. I should not got it. say more we're, than we're that. I think that's little, too much. Edgier, yeah. huh? so, so, well, I got more then. They might broach even further. Drop all of a sudden. I tell you, yeah. <laughs> call me. <laughs> okay. So the next one that was related, I don't know if yeah. you can dig into this, because I heard on the Theory of Everything podcast, too, you were mentioning that Bose-Einstein condensates can allow for room temperature superconductive effects. Is that something you can elaborate on? Um, or is that also kind of pushing it too far? That's more, that's more the, the, um, okay, uh, to understand how uh, the room temperature superconductor that I'm talking about, which is an active room. See, I believe that uh, maybe one way to solve superconductivity at room temperature is not necessarily by material properties, okay. to actually find, for example, LK99 and yeah. so forth, you know, the whole idea of finding a specific material copper barium strontium type no maybe it has to do with a way that you can influence something that is already a superconductor at, at very low temperature but make it a superconductor at much higher temperature so raising the critical temperature yeah and actually uh, uh, there's a great paper out there still on archive and one can google it hopefully it's still on hopefully they haven't taken it down there's a lot of concerted effort to make my work look like pseudoscience. So so someone Google it fast before it goes. It's written by Dr. Victor Lachno, uh, V-I-K-T-O-R, Lachno, or Victor with a C. I'm not sure. I heard you reference But his before, last yeah. name is L-A-K-H-N-O, Lachno. And uh, he's from the Russian Academy, form of the Russian Academy of Sciences. He... Uh, he wrote a paper called um, something, The Road or The Way to High and um, Room Temperature Superconductivity, something of that nature. It used to be on archive, but in reference 10, he actually speaks to the idea that the way that I do it, the way he believes that, um, that my idea on the room temperature superconductor is possible, is that what I'm really doing is forming a Bose-Einstein condensate and then actually moving the condensate because of a certain vibration within that field. Because, mm -hmm. And you can actually read his paper and, and uh, see the last paragraph, and he references me. It's the only, actually the only, um, I believe the only paper out there, you know, in the academic, quote unquote, academic community that actually references that particular idea. And I think uh, he's got, he's he's got quite an. He's got a point. Somebody read that paper carefully. It's the last page, and he references my patent in reference ten, I believe. Oh. So 
still remember that. Yeah, he actually wrote a book recently on high temperature superconductivity as well. But anyway, I digress. Sorry. Yeah. So no, you're fine because that's actually I think you just said the last thing. The next thing I was going to say, which is I heard you say that uh, in a previous interview that extremely low temperatures can create the Bose-Einstein condensate, which can allow uh, things to move as one, the electrons potentially, if I'm saying that correctly. Um, yes, sir. And that they might well, even. We about yeah, go ahead. Is macroscopic quantum coherence the yeah. idea that is possible under certain conditions? For example, what's a superconductor? A superconductor is really, in the words of uh, Phil Anderson, the idea of emergence. Now, Phil Anderson, Nobel Prize with a great mind, uh, he, uh, um, God, I believe he's, uh, he's deceased, but uh, he, uh, um, at one point, he was talking, I forget exactly how he tackled that problem. Anyway, I digress. Oh, that's fine. Uh, look into the work of, of Phil Anderson. Okay. and his idea of emergence and how he links it to something called macroscopic quantum coherence how 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 um a physical object of classical size can behave as a quantum entity under certain conditions what's the difference between That's that and macroscopic, macroscopic quantum decoherence as opposed to coherence now decoherence exactly decoherence that that is the uh, some people think, for example, the gravitational field could be a decoherence method by which something that should result or should have a quantum mechanical. Actually, it was Roger Penrose that mentioned that. But anyway, um, um, the whole idea is decoherence. Uh, it, it's, it's one. As a matter of fact, look into slides four to nine. It's in there. Look into slides four, uh, four to nine in in my AIAA um uh, SciTech 2019 presentation, it's in oh, there. At it, it describes right macroscopic yeah. quantum coherence to a T. Got and it. as a matter of fact, if you have it up, read what I what I write in that particular slide. Like read the whole thing. It's it's uh, uh, yeah. I still yeah. remember being in that room. I actually got a standing ovation for that slide. They yeah. were absolutely I mean, people was we I, I felt so good being able to 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 talk to my peers and, and getting some feedback that was n not so negative in nature. So I'll just it, read it out right was now. A great room. Uh, at least a and actually, of do you know who presented before me in that same room? Robert Zubrin. <laughs> nice. well, we actually met. We had uh, a great guy, too. But uh, okay. You go ahead and read that, please. Yeah, because I actually, I think I quoted this when I was posting these slides on Twitter because there were so many slides, I had to break them up into fours. And part of it was saying that this is this is a vacuum that has undergone macroscopic quantum coherence locally around the craft. As a result, the craft experiences suction into the conditioned vacuum. Um, another part of it says that this may be the very condition to achieve a state of macroscopic quantum coherence. The idea, idea being that we never leave the system uh, this, let the system yeah. achieve thermodynamic equilibrium by constantly yeah. delaying the onset of relaxation to the equilibrium. Hence, the production of maximum entropy is delayed. The system may violently react by generating anomalous emergent phenomena, such as, but not limited to, inertial mass reduction, which we're going to talk about here in a minute, I think. And this speaks to what I call the Prigogine effect. This is the work of Ilya Prigogine. You can say, in a way, that the bias effect is the engineering of the Prigogine effect, what I call the Prigogine effect. His uh, Nobel Prize, I believe, 1973, if I'm not wrong. I remember that the, his Nobel Prize uh, lecture paper being written, I think, December 73. But anyway, uh, he also wrote a book called Order from Chaos, very or Out of Chaos, very interesting. Hmm. Uh, he was, uh, I believe chemistry but uh Ilya Prigozhin was an incredible mind and he basically uh, his his idea was the ordering of uh, what he called dissipated structures that order that chaos can be ordered under certain conditions the idea being you're dealing with a non-linear medium for example a plasma you drive it far from equilibrium hence accelerated vibration or an accelerated spin yeah. And then you have a constant electromagnetic energy going through it, like a flux of some kind. And, and uh, you're able to uh, get these dissipative structures. I think he used the example of Bernard's, something called Bernard cells. Bernard, I'm not, 
it's it's French. Uh, I I should know better since I took so many of them. I believe it's Bernard. Hmm. Uh, the whole idea is, for example, in, in on, on a thin plate, um, if you have a layer of oil, very thin, um, and you hit the plate from underneath, a metal plate, so you, you need conductivity there to make sure, you know, hmm. if it's a dielectric, this thing will never get hit. So, so uh, the the whole idea is uh, they form these in, in time they form hexagonal cells and something that event that begins chaotic the yeah. movement becomes Organized. ordered yeah and he used that in his december 90 an incredible i i suggest everybody go and try to find the um, nobel prize lecture by Ilya prigozhin i believe it was 1973 um something about time fluctuations structure uh, anyway very interesting paper yeah you very mentioned, interesting um i think this may be similar let me know if it is or not but i think you mm -hmm. mentioned um driving the plasma from equilibrium that will begin to self-organize and that the electrons will begin to move in lockstep in one giant matter wave as well yes comments on that. yes i actually used the phrase that another great uh used the uh, wolfgang Ketele. I, I, I absolutely like, love Professor Ketele. The, the only one to re re reply kindly to my <laughs> emails. Like, he, you know, even though he would not support my paper and archive, he, he gave some very good reasons for it. And he, I mean, I'm 100% I'm sure that if I would have kept, you know, nudging him and stuff eventually, he's that kind of person. I, I truly see people like that. Yeah. People like that should get Nobel Prizes, I not agree. people that deride others and make fun of them and call them cranks and crackpots. Please, come I've on, I've had man. similar experiences with academia, and the ones I Very. respect, I'm with you, are the ones that, the people that are willing to talk to anyone, right? Not regardless of what their pedigree is. That's right? Professor Ketele. People that One of humble the themselves, people that don't consider themselves to be soothsayers, so... Those are the types of people he I He got his Nobel Prize for BEC, by the way. Yeah, oh, I, I, he showed it. I think by a combination of something called evaporative cooling and laser cooling. You can actually cool atoms with lasers. Isn't that cool? That's huh? really cool. Anyway, actually relevant. There's a lot of stuff you can do with lasers, so, especially with plasmas. But anyway, I digress. A, so. I'm going I'm <laughs> to press you on this next one then. So is it yeah, feasible to work with uh, electrically charged solids then? I know we've talked a lot, about, a lot about plasmas, but what about solids in general? Any theories there, hypothetically speaking? It's possible under certain conditions, but you need electric charges on the order of coulombs. And um, it's not easy. You can use pelotrons and something called, the pelotrons are a modern version of, of uh, something called a Van de Graaff generator. So you can actually get high charges on, on, on a particular wow. um, uh, metallic uh, substrate, but it, it's, it's, it's not simple. And it's not easy yeah. to keep that charge from discharging to the medium. You know, sometimes you need high pressures. It's, it's uh, how should I say? It's complicated. <laughs> so uh, I, I prefer simple things, and I think the best way to do this is with plasmas. Now, now I'm not saying that plasmas are easy to subdue. As a matter of fact, they're a very interesting animal. Hmm. I sometimes think plasmas have consciousness of their own, but I digress. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. They have like a, almost like a double layer. You have to study what the Hans Alfein thought of plasma. It's very interesting. Yeah. For example, there's another great, uh, Anthony Peratt, the whole idea is that our universe is more than 99.99% plasma. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. And hence the Boussard ramjet, the whole, but then anyway, I, I'm digressing on so many oh, levels. Fine. Okay, go ahead. Sir. I'm sure that the people who are being quoted in reference will appreciate all of the shout outs <laughs> that you're giving them. Uh, so that's why I don't want to slow you down at all. So, I mean, and next, the next thing that kind of feeds into what we were talking about with your slides, which is, and as much as you can speak to it, how does inertial mass reduction work and what does it mean for the capabilities of both technology and propulsion in general? Uh, it works the way that I expressed it in, in my public domain Got it. Papers. Yeah. Uh, what I can speak to, um, even on an experimental level, is, for example, the one thing, in my opinion, is most important, most important is to create these holes in space. That's why when you when you show I, you know, I wanted to make sure that the person that I had the interview with was actually you. I'll, 
Look, this is my confessional. So I actually went to a podcast called The Confessionals. I think Merkel Media or something. Uh, really so good. Cool. Uh, tremendous. Uh, really good dude, too. That dude. Yeah, he's a good guy. But anyway, uh, a very, very nice guy. Uh, and and uh, um, by the way, you you come across, oh, man, you come across really good in that podcast. That, yeah, bravo. People should now, check it out, by the uh, way. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. When I saw when I saw what those orbs did, the local points, the locus of points that they formed, and the moment I actually I actually slowed down and started to, because I actually saw one of them, actually a couple of them went in front of the nose of the aircraft. And this thing was we talk, almost free fall. So we talk about very high speeds, and I kept on thinking they're trying to form a locus like almost like a spherical bubble around the aircraft and then i thought more and more i said oh my god they're actually what these three orbs are doing they're depositing energy at a particular even though it goes with the spacecraft still i think they're moving fast enough to have a locus a locus of points that you can say it's like a spherical bubble that deposits more and more energy within that particular um section of space-time to create this breaking of the Schwingelen. And if you do that, you create a hole in space-time. And when I saw what I saw, I didn't anticipate. When I saw that thing, the 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 the, the hole it formed, and yeah. then I almost saw like a ring that formed around the hole. It was like a, re a refraction of, of the of the yeah, superfluid that's... nature of I said, oh my God. This is the punish effect. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 yeah, yeah. and then I had That's to awesome. pull myself down. And say they would never believe that. Most likely, you know, uh, Ashton will have to go through absolute hell to prove that this is not, you know. Oh my goodness. Well, and, we're going and, through it, sir. We're going. But through anyway, it. yeah. So down. But, I wish you but... the absolute best luck in this because this is the best, the best experimental proof that the quote unquote Pais effect is real. So we'll have to have a follow-up then for sure where we take a look at the videos together and go through it. I think the audience would absolutely love that. For today, though, I just want to stay focused on the science just because, you know, I think we want to vindicate you and your science here. And I think we've done a great job so far of explaining how it can be practical and real, right, as opposed to the detractors who want to dismiss it. Um, now, if you have this inertial mass reduction craft, uh, do you know what would that look like to the observer as they're watching that move? And would you, they produce a field you, or how does that work? Yeah. Have you ever seen Star Wars? Oh, yeah. I can see your the, shirt, the, by the way. But, which, uh, yeah, the the, the X-Wing. Oh, I, I pride myself all the way. <laughs> uh, part of the resistance, baby. You know? <laughs> anyway, the, the Rebel Alliance. But uh, I've always been truly a rebel at heart. But uh, Is it going to look like the hyperspace jump? Did that I they just made? say that? I know that. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> sorry. Anyway. No, no, no. I meant... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, nothing wrong with being a slave. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah. well, as long as our existence depends on others, we are all slaves. Whether we oh, say so or not is a whole different thing. But anyway, let's call ourselves rebels. Got it. While we still I'm can. So, We're the rebel alliance right. right now. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Okay. Now, um, do you remember how the, um, I think they were called, what were they called? The the uh, the imperial Star, cruisers, the, Star cruisers. The, the humongous. Yeah, do you remember how all of a sudden they would just vanish as if a hole was formed into? That's exactly what happened to that triangular structure that I represent in the past. Yeah. That's that's how I envision it, and that's why when I saw what I saw in that video, I said, "Oh my God!" But it's very interesting. Uh, and you're 100% right. They have to be autonomous. And the, mm -hmm. I'm 100% I'm, I'm sure these were uh, some sort of uh, collision avoidance software. There was, I, all I remember is that like inside the orb, because you also showed the thermographs, it, 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 there was some sort of a propulsion plant, some sort of a power plant. You could because see there the was a difference. Right? In, yeah, there was something going on in the middle of that orb. But anyway, yeah, I digress. Sorry about that. No, you're Yeah, you're, but that's what would happen. Uh, yeah. It, People it, are loving it. I can already tell. <laughs> so, okay. So it would look potentially like the hyperspace jump. I think that's really cool. Yes. Um, you yes, actually just answered one of my other questions, which was coming up, which was, you know, do you think that these crafts could be 
uh, there would have to be somebody inside them or could they be remote controlled? You know, I think that's an interesting question, right? With respect to your, I believe, you know, yeah, go ahead. My opinion, both. Both would be possible. I think you can make this, I think you can make it into an interstellar travel. Um, that's cool. I think, I think you can do both. But I think it's far easier to do the, uh, f first of all, uh, the, the loss of human life. Nobody yeah. wants to deal with that. Goodness gracious. So, so much, sometimes so much better to have these autonomous artificial intelligent agents. Mm -hmm. Again, this means if, if it's true what we saw, that means that AI is not a new thing at all. But anyway, 10 years uh, ago, almost, right? I, I digress. I digress way too much. Oh, I, I have another theory on something I call the triarchy of sentience. Eventually, we'll talk about it. It's very oh, interesting. Curious. It has to do with artificial intelligence. For example, in my opinion, you can test whether something has become um, artificial general intelligence by basically seeing if, if it can generate given, say, textbook data. So we're not talking about stuff that just pulled from the internet, but the stuff that's pulled from physics manuals, something that's been experimentally proven. So using textbook data, given a certain computational power level, I believe as long as the AI, the AI agent can generate an original concept, it wow. becomes AGI. That's really AGI interesting, AGI, thinking of GP, chat GPT. Yeah, go ahead. Super oh. intelligence is not very far off. So I, anyway. I'm not, I'm digressing on so many levels, but I, uh, hmm. another thing, for example, the super force speaks to a super density and eventually I'll talk on that too. Something called, uh, so super force, super bang because of the super density and super intelligence. Again, I call it the triarchy of creation. Ah, you know, after all, I'm a crackpot, right? So since my That's hubris true. level has been, you know, inflated to the max, well, why not? Break the swing a little bit. Okay. I'm kidding. Why not just change right. the whole world? Because that's what I think we're doing here, sir. That's what I think we're looking at. Um, if you can yeah. prove, if you can prove that that video is for Ashton, that is a Nobel Prize, brother. I, if I if I was the Stockholm community, I'd freaking immediately give, give you a Nobel Prize in imagery or something, or I don't know, like creative thinking. Or, I'll just take a Pulitzer, you know? I don't need the Nobel <laughs> Prize. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's only if, uh, you know, like you, you I, get a prize, so, I, I yeah. also have to say at this point that, uh, I would never hurt myself and, uh, yeah, I'm never going to do anything <laughs> like that either. Just want to make sure that that's oh, on the goodness. record here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just kidding. Yes. yes. Neither Ashton nor I would ever suicide ourselves. No, Thank you. Never, never <laughs> in any circumstances. Um, that's right. So also, I just want to dig into a little bit kind of what you just mentioned, which uh, kind of digs into the stuff we were talking about is that in your uh, patents, you talk about nonlinear medium using a plasma resonating inside a cavity uh, yes, related to microwaves. And then you also say that you can convert high frequency uh, electromagnetic waves into gravitational waves. Can you speak to that at all? That has to do with another paper I put out on, I think, the Society of Automotive Engineers. Remind me to send you that paper. I, okay. I also have that. I think, yeah, uh, it's like starts with 2040, that paper. But anyway, it, it was published in the, uh, it's, it's, it's a paper that was needed uh, to, to get uh, the patent. Um, that was incredible, though. That, that office action was a first. I mean, they actually approved it as a first, the high, high frequency gravitation wave generator. It could be because uh, uh, prior to this, they were shown to be, I mean, we're talking about the genius of Kip Thorne here, you know, and, and, and Barry Barish and LIGO, for goodness sake. I mean, you know, the greats, experimental and theoretical Kip Thorne, of course, just like Penrose got it for black holes. But anyway, and, and, and by the way, Sir Roger Penrose, or you should be called Lord in my opinion. So Lord Penrose, if you're ever watching this, there are no such thing as space-time singularities. I'm sorry I disagree with you. We can have an argument on it. I yeah. think uh, uh, Abhay Ashtakar is correct, as in there's a quantum bounce. So in other words, it never goes to zero. It goes to something on the order of the Planck density, hmm. which talks to the super density. But anyway, that's a whole different ballgame. We'll talk about the super density one day because it talks to the super bang. Yeah. Not the big bang, the super bang. Hmm. All right. All right, sir.
Yeah, right. so I've got a few more questions that are kind of similar to stuff we've talked about. I don't know if some of it's going back. Um, you know, and I think I heard something on your Theory of Everything podcast where you talked about there being a thin insulator regarding your inertial mass reduction craft. Does this actually have to be a physical element or can this be something that can be produced by a field of some sort as well? What are your thoughts on that? It's a very good question, sir. I'll leave it there. <laughs> I love it. That's I love when I get that answer, honestly, because uh, the same reason why I send in uh, Freedom of Information Act requests, like I don't care what the answer is, because no matter what the answer is, I, I glean information off of it uh, as an investigator. Um, now, I guess the next part, too, is kind of related to what we were just talking about with, uh, you know, not to go into the, the videos that we were talking about, but the effect, the, what we see there in the videos is uh, you, you mentioned, I think, with the pairing up of electrons causing potentially a suction effect or potentially create an avoid that may create the suction effect? It what, what creates a void that? within the vacuum. Mm -hmm. So it's exactly what you see. It's almost like a black hole. Yeah. But Is it a black it's, hole? It's, I guess that's my question. See, oh my goodness. I am, Does it matter like how you define you black know, hole? I have a feeling between you and I, I have a feeling that every black hole for every black hole is a white hole. So, so, I thought that so, so in other words, it's kind of like a wormhole kind of. Mm -hmm. So you have the ability to actually transport from one point to another. So, so for, for example, for going from point A to point C without actually going through point B. Yeah. I think we too. don't really understand what the quantum vacuum is all about. Hmm. And I have a feeling that there's so much more to physics that I think we're still in our infancy. We think we almost know it all. No, no, I, agree I think that. physics, it's almost, I would say, three maybe four months old that's a long time till this thing becomes an adult basically i think jfk mentions that too is that the greater our knowledge increases the greater our ignorance unfolds and i look back at that and i think that we think we're so advanced but we are still potentially cavemen compared to where we could possibly be is my view and it's funny you bring up the black hole white hole situation that's always something i've wondered about too because what we see in physics is symmetry a lot right the so idea like, that the, if, if you opposite? must have an entrance, why not an exit? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And so uh, when you're generating this void in the space time continuum, which I believe you argue with these certain energy densities getting to that, um, would this potentially energize particles outside of the void, do you think? Or any thoughts or theories on what might happen there? And do you think it would I'm at least look sure. like a black hole? I, will, I, I, I I mean, I could speculate. I can give you my speculation. Yeah, please. I think it would be a whole local phenomena. I have mm. a feeling almost mm. nothing. Uh, maybe something that... Um, uh, I'm not sure whether, for example, the clouds, because you mentioned there were clouds. Like, were those clouds in any way, could you see them move in, in yeah. any way? Only slightly. And I'm not mm. sure. Yeah. I, I have a feeling that the the effect would be highly local. Interesting. And it's it's as if a portal is open yeah. within a, a fabric of some sorts, but somehow this fabric has the ability to recongeal yeah. almost spontaneously. It's weird. Again, the whole idea is that once you remove this energy density, this thing just comes back, and that's hmm. why super intelligence. I truly believe what we're dealing with. The energy, the universe is a sentience. It's a sentient being. Hmm. And and I tell you, we better be careful what we do with our planet. Because you know what antibodies are. Yeah, they fight back, right? Against mm -hmm. anything that they does it unwanted things, right? Hmm. Yeah. Boy, that, that makes me think about some other theories that I wouldn't mind talking with you on another podcast as well, which is into more of the you know what are the implications of you know this advanced technology where it came from and what it would mean for you know lots of other philosophical uh, approaches but we can save that for another time that's another thing physics and philosophy must be brit again we must marry these two agreed the divorce that went between physics and philosophy should have never been allowed i believe physics has so much to to uh, to gain from remarrying philosophy. And I think Carlo Rovelli, others like him, uh, Lee Smolin, it, 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 oh man, that's a physicist. I, I would love him in the committee. 
both of them. But I think Lee Smolin has taken a Canadian citizenship. And, you know, there's a so in other words, the people that would be in this committee would have to be United States citizens due to certain things. I would, yeah. I would say, you know, and I'm pretty sure the committee would be. Unfortunately, I would love to have it televised, but I have a feeling, you know, my betters, my superiors would, would not, <laughs> you know, would agree maybe to a skip conference rather than anyway. Yeah. yeah, I'm not going to go there. Well, that's yeah, why I'm glad I don't have any NDAs and don't have to worry about those types of things. But I understand the, the yeah, prickly yeah. situation that you might be in, sir. So, again, I just appreciate that you're, you know, able to talk freely about this type of stuff. And, yeah, you know, you well, can thank always you, reach sir. out thank if you anything for that. It's just that I was super furious when when I saw the, the, the changes they did to the Wikipedia page. I mean, for goodness sake, pseudoscience? That's like you know, uh, uh, vomiting in my face and then spitting on it too, you know? <laughs> I, I mean, what else? You got to take the shit in. I'm like, excuse my language. <laughs> oh, you're fine. I'm, I'm a, you know, I, uh, I grew I'm up Martin, in New York. This is not for children. A, a tapestry of obscenity second to none. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, uh, yeah. So I have only a couple other questions. I was thinking maybe we'd open it up to some uh, live chat questions if I see some yeah. out there. So um one last thing that i've been curious about which is uh and this kind of goes into the uip phenomenon and but it's definitely related to your scientific approach is do you think this craft or your craft that you have kind of uh patented can go through solid matter or are there limitations to it what do you, what is your thoughts on that because i know that we they talk about multi-trans like different uh, being able to go through different mediums right water air space but what about That's solid mass that. right um let me just say there are no impossibilities just conditional possibilities under certain conditions everything and anything is possible mm. a trick and this is where it all comes is how to engineer those conditions Interesting. So in a way, I've answered your question. In a way, I haven't. But yeah, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Uh, I think, uh, you know, one of my favorite characters in, 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 in shows, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't the American version of House of Cards. It was the British version. Uh, uh, his name was Francis Urquhart. Uh, F.U. It's pretty interesting how the initials go. Yeah. And he, he used to say, you may possibly say so. I could not possibly comment. <laughs> I, I don't it. know, but that thing stuck in my mind. That show was great. Right. At least I watched the American version until the last oh, season. Oh, oh, oh. Unfortunately, yeah. you know. Cannot, yeah, don't mention the name or you'll get, the, you oh, know, you'll get this. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't and, want to get yeah. us removed here. It's, um, it's, yeah, a total, it's a total loss, though, because, oh, oh my it God. It was great I, until then. Remember the usual suspect? Oh, yeah. What? A, what? A, I mean, whoa. Anyway. Great movie. Yeah. Uh, so um, one thing I want to ask or say as well, this is just kind of a general statement I have before we jump into the questions, is that, you know, if your daughter's watching, I want her to know that you are a great man. And all the anyone who says negative stuff about you, they can come talk to me Maybe because <laughs> that's nonsense. You're, you're, you know, just for you, your dad is an amazing person. He's going to be mm -hmm. a historic figure, potentially, potentially even in the history books. So ignore all the nonsense that the haters would say. They don't mean anything. They don't even matter, honestly. And that's the way you deal with them is you don't let it get to you. So that's You're all I wanted man. to say to her if she's watching. God bless you, sir. God bless you for that. Thank you very much for saying this. Uh, yeah. yeah, she 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 tries. She 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 tries so hard. One, one time I found her crying and she was reading so I said, please, oh my God, read it of yeah. all things. I I mean, you don't read that stuff, you know. But anyway, yeah, she she is a. Uh, She's going to be 12 soon enough, but still, you know, she, she's a sensitive kid. I wish she, she took it more from her mother, but, uh, yeah, you know, she, she took it from me, unfortunately. Okay. So yeah, she's a great kid. Thank you for that. No God problem, bless you, sir. sir. If you have any children, same goes to I yours. Appreciate it. So, appreciate it. I don't, but I appreciate are, that anyway. I'm I'll sure my family right will be happy that. to know that. <laughs> you are able to prove this. You will definitely get a prize. Yeah. Uh, to me, it's just and about again, the truth. You know? Let us let us reiterate: neither Ashton Forbes nor Salvatore Pais would ever suicide ourselves. Thank you. Hundred percent. Right. And yeah, for me, it's about the same name as my podcast: hard truths. Right? These are hard truths that are hard for people to accept, uh, but they are true, and we still have to look, even though we don't want to accept it. We have to look. 
Yeah, so I've yeah. got a couple questions from the audience here, uh, if you're ready to go. go I don't, um, one of the first ones here is they want to ask you about the relationship between the pious effect and exotic vacuum objects. Apparently they go by a number of different variety of names. Are you familiar with those? those and sure. can you speak to sure. that? If you, yes, yes. But that's a very interesting, uh, the, the whole idea of, uh, super cavitation, the whole idea of uh, sonoluminescence and, uh, what was the name of that gentleman? I remember reading some papers on him. He was, he, he was quite a, quite an engineer. I, shame on me for for not remembering the 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 EVOs. If they can put that in the in in the in the live stream, that'd be great, you know. So you can. Uh, but anyway, mm -hmm. um, I'm not quite sure of their similarities. I think mine is a more general form of it. Mine is really the engineering of the Prigogine effect. That's yeah. what it is. I I think that's the best way to say it. It it really deals with taking things far from equilibrium. And, and again, the whole idea of rapid acceleration transient, the whole idea that you don't, that you don't have you, the, the, the time differential of your acceleration is non-zero. Hmm. That's very important. And don't forget equation seven. Please do not forget equation seven in the IEEE TPS paper that the plasma compression fusion hmm. device, it speaks to something very interesting, an energy runway that, that, um, uh, an exponential increase with time and accelerating vibrational frequency. Hmm. Read that. Be very careful when you look at that equation. That 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 says a lot of things. So uh, I hope I answered Looking some of it. that. Um, yeah, I, I, I hope I. But definitely, God, what was his name? Now it really drives me crazy. He he was quite a character. An incredible incredible mind he also went for hell uh i'll put it on the screen God. here for people to see for a second shame on me shame on me for for forgetting that man's name I really god so there's the answer for that oh, oh no problem sorry. so I, somebody else had another question which they wanted to ask about mm -hmm. your thoughts on er mm -hmm. equals epr uh what are your thoughts on Einstein that Rosen. The Einstein Rosen bridge equals Einstein Podolsky Rosen. The whole idea, the quantum entanglement, really speaks to this uh, bridge between these two particles. Mm -hmm. But think what particles are. The superforce says that the proton can act as a black hole. So, if so, why not the electron? Maybe the electron is also a black hole. Hmm. Maybe all particles act as black holes. And as a, as a matter of fact, maybe that's why we see these uh, quote unquote particles not disintegrating. For example, the proton, the decay time is on the order of 10 to the 34th. I don't know exactly the, the unit of measure, but even seconds would be horrendously large. So, so uh, but most likely the proton will not decay unless you do something. Again, I am not sure exactly how the super force speaks, speaks to, for example, the Higgs field. I think, for example, the Higgs field speaks of a different scale. Hmm. I think the super force is so fundamental. It exists at the Planck scale. It actually drives everything. Hmm. Put it this way. It is the force to rule them all. Yeah. One force to rule them all. One force to find them. One force to bring them all. And in the darkness, find them. And it's interesting. They talk about dark energy. Maybe that's what the darkness refers to. But anyway. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, some other stuff. Let's see what people have. Well, people wanted to first say that we love you back, you know, so uh, everybody's a big fan of you in the chat right now. Just let you uh, know. They're, they're um, great people. Thank people you People want to know much. what gives you hope for a better world. I think that's an interesting philosophical question. Um, okay. What gives you hope for okay. a better world? I, I, you know, I was, I, I, I had to turn the, uh, TV off in, in the morning. I, I was I was hoping for some better news. And again, physics and politics should not mix. So I I am totally apolitical. Consider me totally. I'm okay, but I will say this and listen carefully. And I will say this in both Romanian and Russian. Slushaid, ascolta bene. And now I will say what I have to say. Credo in unum Deum, Patrem Omnipotentem, Nihil Sine Deo. Baruch Atah Adonai Melochet, Elohenu Melech Haolam. 
Bismillah, Irakman, Zirahim, Inshallah, Mohammed, Irayzuli. Different languages, different religions, yet signifying all is one, one is all. Unless we come together, we shall fall apart. Unification. Yeah. That's what all these languages speak to the one truth. And you know what that truth is. Why yeah. can't we just come together? This is the only way we have a chance. A unification of civilization will give us the ability to go to the stars. Otherwise, that chance will never come. Yeah. Not the way, not the, the path we're on. Hmm. That's all I have to say. Awesome. I think they also figured out who the uh, doctor was. Dr. Ken Shoulders, I think, is the potential yes, name. Sir. You're thinking yes, sir. Oh yeah. Chad, yes. Chad had it was on top of it for you. What a great they dude. Got it. Oh, my God. A, a remarkable. Yes. Remarkable yeah. mind. As a matter of fact, you know, this whole idea of uh, the negative energy, then, you know, the whole idea of the formation of the hole for which this thing is sucked. Yeah. That's that's the science of someone called, uh, I God, I forget. He used to go by the name David Froning, but I believe his name was Herman, Herman David Froning. I think David was his middle name, but David Froning, Dr. Froning, University of Adelaide, I believe, Australia. Very interesting man. You have to look, I think in one of my papers, I actually uh, cite him and I, I, I regarded him along with people like uh, John Brandenburg, uh, uh, Paul Murad, he, he, he recently passed from cancer. The, these were great, great people. These are great people. Some of them are still alive, but I believe uh, Dr. Froning and, um, and, uh, and Mr. Murad are no longer with us. Hmm. Uh, Mr. Brandenburg, thank goodness, is still with us. He's, he is a good man. He, is a good, he should be listened to tremendously. He's GEM theory, G-E-M, Gravito Electro Gravitic, hmm. uh, Electromagnetic Theory, GEM, G-E-M should be looked into uh, absolutely uh, it's fascinating and he also talks to the pointing vector he he was able to actually um um show the 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 mass of the higgs particle that's huge because we, we're really talking to the higgs field there's not yeah. that's why the whole idea of the god particle please there are no such thing as particles there's fluctuations yeah. in mm -hmm. fields what exists is the but anyway no. again digressing sorry Next oh, question. You're fine. No, I think we're, we're drying up, but I have a question for you as well, which is um, another physicist that I've been talking to has a theory called dilation theory. And um, I think that the way he would describe it is that time is a fluid symmetry and that you can essentially take gravity out of the equation. And it's another way to simplify the mathematics. I think similar to what you do, achieves the same perhaps conclusion, but goes about doing it a slightly different way. Um, and the reason why I liked his theories in general, I'm just curious your thoughts on them, is that you know, the idea is the less mass, the faster things, the faster time flows. The more mass, the slower time, time flows. Time is incredible. It's pretty time, cool, right? Time dilation. Been, yeah, time. I wish I understood. I, I think of time as some sort of energy field. I wish I understood more. For example, gravity responds to time. Why? And, and it, it, Again, we're talking about physical time here. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about the time as we understand measured by clocks. Because remember, clocks themselves are made of what? Atoms. And atoms respond to the quantum vacuum and the manipulation thereof. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very careful by saying, oh, there's no such thing as physical time. You know, uh, today is equal to more. Please, I don't think we really understand time, what it really means. Yeah. And since we don't understand time, how can you say you understand space time, the unification the the of the same, right? Yeah. So, so you, we have to be careful to to to. That's why I'm saying we are only in the infancy of physics, maybe two, three year month old mm -hmm. compared to what other. Anyway, yes, so, definitely not an act, octogenarian. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to go ahead and thank you here. I'll let you go ahead and say you have last words. I want to let you kind of say whatever you want to say. It can be, you know, anything I, that's come to your mind. I just here. want to say one thing and one thing. Only. I hope we have other interviews. Okay, I, I, I truly, I, I respect you, sir. I respect you 100%. And I honor your, your, uh, your investigative uh, approach, your research, and your ability not to give up. 
That's what it's all about. No matter how much crap, how much fecal matter they fraught you, just every now and then deflect, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it smells, what can you do? Keep on going. Achieve sure. that objective. And trust me, Ashton, if you're able to prove this, wow. Yeah. And again, stating this for the audience, neither Ashton Forbes nor Salvatore Pais would ever suicide ourselves. No. Thank you. Never. All right. Um, actually, okay. I did have one last question too, which I hope yes. is not because you, you work for Space Force now. Is that is that correct? Uh, or with them? Uh, I uh, since I mean uh, we have people. I, I sir, to to me uh, too much. I don't. I I can't stand lies. Lies yeah. to me, you know, like the, the, this whole yeah, idea yeah. that uh, lies, layers of lies upon lies, becoming accepted truths. For God's mm -hmm. sake, uh, it's just. It's just an, an, a total anathema, like like sacrilege to me. So I'm not going to lie. No, I don't work for the Space Force right now. Okay. I, I work for the United States Navy. Got it. Okay. But I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Well, in that All case, right. then, I, yeah, I would just close out and say, you know, this is the Hard Truths podcast, number one. This is a, a big one. I mean, I respect you more than you respect me, as much as you might think that. We each have our own frame of reference, and perhaps it's a, you know, balancing act. But you're one yep. of my favorite people on the planet. I've been talking with you offline as well. Oh, um, and, you know, I want nothing more than to vindicate you and your science that you've put out there. Um, and, you know, I want you to stay strong <laughs> as well because I know that you have been getting yes. attacked. And hopefully this podcast wins yes. to some degree to, you know, have people take you seriously, which they should. Absolutely. Anyone who I not really need a committee. I need a committee of highly credible, highly accredited scientists, Nobel Prize winners. We talk about uh, Lee Smolin. We talk about Seth Lloyd. We talk about um, Brian Keating. We're talking about uh, even Eric Weinstein. Yeah. I mean, why not? Even though he's not of the so-called correct physics pedigree, his idea of geometric unity is quite interesting, even though some papers uh, were written against it. Please, you know, everybody should have some say. But Again, give me a committee of highly credible people. And in one hour, I promise you, one hour, I can prove to them that I at least know what I'm talking about, at least mm -hmm. that I'm correct and at least partially correct. And if not, sir, I promise never to do a podcast again, never to even like publish one more paper. That'd be oh, no. it. Well, well, make sure well, that which, you're successful. Which between you and I, between you and I, it's not happening anyway. So it's like... I'm getting I'm I'm getting so many rejections I just stop I you know like now I just go for for preprints because in my opinion it's almost as good as you know as long as the server survives and you're able to sh uh, uh, that's why I ask you please show that paper to everyone yep. you know just send it up because it's like a domino effect even if the service gets shut down yeah somebody will have that paper and somebody will say damn this crackpot wasn't such a crap one after all but anyway so do you want to plug anything as well I, that was a good somebody brought that up anything you want to plug do you have a twitter do you have any place where people can find oh, no work? no sir i'm i'm totally off social media oh my uh, goodness are you kidding me and uh, that again that that thing of the uh, i think between you and i the, yeah. uh, the having social media is conducive to that s thing that we oh, it definitely is. anyway so yeah yeah no 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 okay. no absolutely not so um, I just want to say, please also go on Kurt Jai Mangal's Theories of Everything. That was a great uh, Please also go to Tim Ventura interviews. Also Project Unity, Jay Anderson, oh, incredible dude. And don't forget Jeremy Riss, alien scientist. I mean, very interesting. And that group of people, that uh, those two dudes, uh, Jeremiah, the engineer, and uh, Michael Perone, mm -hmm. he did a thing with Tim Ventura on LK99. Watch, whoa! That yeah. he's a real material scientist. Yeah, I was watching so, the anyway, uh, yeah. okay, not in closely. But so yeah, um, Sal's yeah. going to be on the Alien podcast or the Alien the Scientist uh, um, stream next week. So guys, check that out for sure. I'm sure it'll be a great follow up to what we've been doing here as well. I just want to thank you one more last time, Sal. I couldn't be more appreciative. And we can chat for a few minutes offline here. But thank you very much, Absolutely. chat, and everybody who's on here today. Uh, everyone who's there on the podcast, this was uh, the very first inaugural of the Hard Truths podcast. Have a great day, everybody.